Uh, it's our pleasure today to have Chris Gobler to uh, give one of our seminars. Chris um, holds a BA from the University of Delaware and a master's and PhD uh, degree from the State University of New York at Stony Brook, which is also my alma mater, so I know he must be a really smart guy. Uh, he's also the director of academic programs on the Southampton campus of Stony Brook. Uh, Chris has a very active research lab that looks at uh, phytoplankton dynamics in coastal systems. He uh, has an emphasis on uh, especially harmful algal blooms and the regulation of their growth um, through zooplankton grazing and nutrient inputs and um, grazing by bivalves. Uh, he also has a wide-ranging interest in eutrophication of coastal systems and what that does to the ecosystem and um, similar interest in coastal acidification and the impact of that on uh, these shallow coastal systems. So um, both, both for algae and for um, high valve larvae. So uh, we are happy to have him to present. I think he's going to give a very interesting talk on um, coastal acidification and multiple stresses. Take it away, Chris. OK, great. Thank you, Beth, and thank you uh, for the invitation to speak here. Um, and thank you to the audience for listening live or taped. Uh, and to my talk today, as you can see in the title, is going to focus on coastal ocean acidification uh, and how it co-occurs with other stressors and what that means for life in shallow coastal ecosystems. As an overview, I'll give a very brief introduction. Uh, about uh, acidification, specifically its co-occurrence with other stressors. And then I'm going to focus on the co-occurrence of low oxygen and acidification in northeast U.S. estuaries. And then I'm going to talk about how those conditions in those systems uh, may affect early life stages of both bivalves and early life stages of what we call large fish. Uh, to hop right into it, I'm going to start with this figure on ocean acidification from Caldera and Wicket more than a decade ago. Uh, I like the figure because it gives you the general sense of how we expect ocean acidification to proceed. That is, as mankind will combust its fossil fuels, our atmosphere will become enriched in carbon dioxide, and as that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere comes to equilibrium with our surface ocean, um, the pH of the surface ocean with time will decline. Uh, and importantly, this is one of the first papers to give recognition to the fact uh, that our surface oceans had already declined uh, in pH by 0.1 units. And it was this uh, research that actually inspired sort of the original research, or the first research that my lab conducted in ocean acidification, where we were focused on early life stage bivalves. Uh, so this is representative of that first stage of work we did, uh, where we looked at a range of CO2 levels, considering both the levels that were present uh, during pre-industrial times, levels today, and also levels we expect in the future. Uh, and then we reared larval stages, in this case, base scallops and hard clams at these different CO2 levels. And we reared them all the way from fertilization all the way until they were fully metamorphosed. Uh, and what we found in this, in, in a series of studies, but is what's shown clearly here, um, is that certainly increasing levels of CO2 to significantly the survival of these larval bivalves. Uh, and, and then importantly, uh, the levels of CO2 that we have today actually yielded lower survival than when we used even lower CO2, which suggested that the change or the acidification that's already occurred uh, in the ocean is already affecting uh, current populations, in this case, of uh, bivalves. And you know, they say a picture is worth a thousand words, and you can see here at TMs of the individuals from this exact experiment, not only was there lower survival, but you can see as they went from the lowest levels of CO2 to the highest, they got significantly smaller as well. So it affects both on growth and survival. Now, shortly after that paper came out, uh, a lot of biogeochemists began talking about the idea that, uh, you know, as our ocean changes, we need to consider not just the fact that it's warming, not just the fact that it's acidifying, but also the fact that oxygen levels uh, are declining or are expected to decline with time. So this paper by Nikki Gruber 
the idea of the warm, sour, and breathless ocean uh, is that in the future our oceans will be warmer, more acidic, uh, and also lower in oxygen. Um, but this particular paper, the focus was on the open ocean, but as it turns out, if we turn to our coastal oceans, uh, it may be these situations uh, or these changes are already happening or can already be found. So this paper earlier, I guess just last year by Carlos Duarte, uh, emphasized the effects of anthropogenic processes on changing uh, pH and coastal systems. And you know, there's been a growing recognition um, that in eutrophic ecosystems, uh, acidification is a modern day problem. Uh, and so that is the idea that as we accelerate nutrient loading to our coastal zone and stimulate algal blooms, it's the decay of those blooms that will result in an increase in CO2 and a decrease in pH. Uh, and I highlight here a paper uh, uh, by Kai and Al that, uh, from a couple of years ago that emphasizes the idea of eutrophication and coastal ocean acidification. Uh, that particular study was in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, but you can see also on, on other coasts, so the, the Gulf Coast, but also on the West Coast, so we're all familiar with the idea of uh, upwelling on the West Coast, bringing high CO2 water up into the shelf, uh, and of course up in Washington State, the recognition of how this having a negative effect on oyster populations there, both wild and aquaculture. Um, and this study by George Walbusser and Chesapeake Bay showing that with time, that particular system uh, during the summer, at least, is experiencing lower pH uh, during summer months. So as we think about our coastal ecosystems, um, you know, generally ideal habitats for fisheries uh, under this, in this schematic here in a pristine conditions, uh, something on the order of uh, 80 or 90 percent of U.S. fisheries, uh, the organisms spend at least part of all of their time in estuaries with uh, conditions that are generally great for uh, supporting those fisheries, but as those estuaries become anthropogenic, anthropogenically impacted, there's a whole host of stressors that can show up. Um, I just mentioned acidification, um, harmful algal blooms or uh, non-optimal food is another uh, stressor, uh, and of course low oxygen and hypoxia, hypoxia is yet another issue. Um, so it's today, today's coastal oceans that can be warmer more acidic and lower than in oxygen uh, uh, than would be ideal for hosting marine fisheries. So uh, that function is here now. Uh, and so as we think about our coastal systems, think about uh, understanding how climate change may be affecting uh, open ocean organisms, we may turn to our coastal systems to better understand how the future of ocean uh, conditions may be manifesting themselves in the coastal oceans and how that may affect life there. Um, of these different stressors, um, that is being warmer and lower in oxygen uh, and acidification, uh, the first two have received the most attention, probably the temperature effects first, uh, and that's mostly because of the recognition uh, that the, in addition to the ocean being a little bit more acidic, we also know, of course, that uh, the Earth's temperatures have gone up uh, about 0.8 degrees during the last uh, century or so, and that's expected to continue in the future. So there's been a lot of research already in the acidification realm that considers both acidification and temperature. And I'll just give a quick example of that here. Um, uh, again, one of those first studies done in my lab that considered acidification. The next stressor we looked at was temperature. Uh, and indeed, when we did that, uh, what's shown here is the survival of mercenary mercenaria larvae. These are hard clams. Again, like the last experiment, reared from fertilization through to metamorphosis, so the metamorphosis individuals shown here. Uh, and we used three different levels of CO2, two different temperatures, one that we have today, one that we expect uh, will be in, uh, occurring during summers when these individuals are spawning in the future. And our results showed that um, there was a CO2 effect, uh, but also a very strong temperature effect uh, and these two different stressors uh, combine to additively give very poor outcomes for the survival of these hard clam larvae, uh, demonstrating that these co-stressors, uh, warming and acidification, uh, can be very detrimental to this particular fishery. Now, 
the last stressor of the three that's received, I think, less attention when it comes to acidification research has been hypoxia. Uh, and as we're all familiar, uh, hypoxia is really a global issue. This is a paper by Diaz and Rosenberg from 2008 in Science that sh shows, in, at that point in time, at least the documentation of widespread hypoxia across Europe, Southeast Asia, and of course on all three coasts of the United States. Uh, less reporting in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, because frankly less monitoring and, uh, and research being done there. Um, a lot of this hypoxia is occurring in estuaries, uh, and that's not surprising given the fact that most estuaries uh, are net heterotrophic. So this is a study uh, that I think illustrates that nicely by Caffrey and estuaries uh, from 2004. And what essentially this looked at was the ecosystem metabolism of 44 estuaries across the U.S. Uh, and what it showed is that uh, almost, if you exclude those that are dominated by, by submerged aquatic vegetation, almost all of the other estuaries are net heterotrophic. Um, that is, annually, uh, they're consuming, not producing it. Uh, and you can see that's most extensive in, in estuaries dominated by either marshes or mangroves. And of course, if you have uh, the consumption of oxygen via respiration, as I've alluded to already, uh, that very process of respiration is producing CO2 and therefore leading to acidification. Um, and, and in fact, this should happen in a very stoichiometrically balanced uh, way. So the, those examples I already gave, this slide I showed earlier, uh, the same regions that are experiencing the acidification that are eutrophic are also known to experience hypoxia or low oxygen. Uh, that is, well, from the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, hypoxia in Chesapeake Bay, and the fact that upwell waters, in addition to being uh, bringing up high CO2 waters, are also waters that are low in oxygen. Uh, so you can see in, from this survey here, uh, good documentation on the West Coast, the Gulf Coast, Chesapeake Bay. Um, but what about the East U.S.? This is a seminar for NECAN. And, um, you know, the Northeast Corridor is the most populous part of the United States. Um, the largest uh, metropolis in the U.S. is New York City. Uh, and so in that particular region, we know there's hypoxia, but we don't have a lot of information on uh, the co-occurrence of acidification. That's the first thing I'm going to focus on uh, now in the seminar and specifically talk about some studies uh, that my group has undertaken in three uh, major estuaries, Narragansett Bay, uh, which is uh, bordered by both Rhode Island and Massachusetts, uh, the city of Providence that's at its headwaters, um, Long Island Sound, the third largest estuary in the United States, uh, which is bordered by New York City, uh, and Jamaica Bay, which is a, a lagoonal system uh, and bordered by the boroughs of Brooklyn and Queens within New York City. Uh, all these systems, somewhat eutrophic, um, with a gradient of eutrophication in most of them as well. Just very briefly talk about the approach we're using when we do our uh, field surveys. We're making continuous measurements of CO2 and pH. Uh, for continuous CO2 measurements, we're using a hydrocy probe that's made by Contros. Uh, for continuous pH measurements, we're using a CFET uh, that's made by Atlantic. Uh, and of course, a CFET is using uh, ion selective field effective transistors uh, as its technology to measure pH on a total scale. Of course, we're not just relying on these pros, we're also collecting discrete measurements for all of our field work uh, so we can uh, confirm uh, measurements made with these probes and also. Uh, calculate uh, the dynamics of carbonate chemistry. Um, so we're measuring DIC using an environmental gas analyzer by PP system. Uh, we measure pH uh, spectrophotometrically. Also, we have a, a handheld um, uh, ion selective field effect transistor uh, pH monitor, a Duraset. Uh, we have optodes for measuring oxygen. We're also doing Winkler titrations. Uh, we're getting standard reference material from Andrew Dixon's lab, uh, and we run that material twice with any analytical run uh, at the beginning and at the end to assure that we're getting uh, the numbers we believe we are. Uh, and then we're calculating our carbonate chemistry using CO2 
uh, sits, uh, and we're using the uh, dissociation constants of, uh, of Valera now, which are specifically for estuaries. And we've gotten good uh, correspondence between our discrete measurements of PSU or uh, discrete measurements of PCO2 and pH, uh, or PCO2, of course, those are calculated, and our continuous measurements with our probes. Uh, and it's documented in a paper coming out on uh, Bauman and Al uh, uh, later this year. Okay, so to look at the dynamics of oxygen and acidification in New York estuaries, I'm going to start with um, a cruise track within Jamaica Bay. Again, this is on the south shore uh, of Long Island near New York City. <coughs> Pardon me. So for this particular cruise track, we began in the northeast extent of this system and then progressed out the inlet that actually goes through New York Bay to out the Rockaway Inlet, which really is exchanged with the Atlantic Ocean. In Port, this is the Harlem Transect Survey. So we're really measuring surface water is about a half a meter, uh, and this is a middle-of-the-day cruise, and this is actually in the fall. Um, and so you can see, even under those conditions where one might expect the water would be fully oxygenated and normal pH, uh, that's not what we see at all. You can see, uh, and then particularly in the um, eastern extent of the system, very high levels of CO2, uh, over 1,000 parts per million. Uh, and low levels of oxygen, hypoxic water in the northeast extent, uh, and low oxygen waters uh, throughout that area. And importantly, uh, if we look at the co-dynamics of the CO2 and oxygen, you can see a very tight correspondence between these two, um, demonstrating how intimately linked they are, and likely supporting the idea that it's respiration driving these trends. Now, importantly, in Jamaica Bay, uh, this is a system with many sewage treatment plants. And so, and, and in fact, there's one in the northeast extent here uh, called the 26 Ward plant uh, that has a significant amount of discharge. Now, of course, this is also a tributary, so it's hard to resolve this. But we looked at this more carefully in an estuary just to the west of this site, uh, excuse me, to the east of the site known as Hempstead Bay. And that's what's shown here. This is a transect that began in the Atlantic Ocean and ended in the Atlantic Ocean, went into uh, what's known as the Jones Inlet on the south shore of Long Island, transitioned through the Reynolds Channel, and then moved north into Hempstead Bay. And what I'll emphasize here at this particular point within the estuary is a discharge pipe for something you known as the Bay Park Sewage Treatment Plant. The plant itself is located uh, up on the mainland, but there's a pipe that runs that discharges here. And so I'm showing this just to emphasize the idea. As you can see, when you're within two to three kilometers to the east or west, uh, that water is enriched in PCO2. Uh, and in fact, in some cases, right by the pipe, over 1,000 parts per million. Um, so this evidence is the uh, importance of sewage discharge as a point source of PCO2. Um, certainly, there's a lot of microbial activity within sewage treatment plants. Uh, so, and further, the organic matter associated with that could stimulate respiration right within the water column. Um, so it, wh whether it's direct from the sewage treatment plant or stimulating microbial activity in the general region, uh, these discharge sites are areas of high pCO2, and we'll emphasize that further uh, for some other systems. Uh, and now, the next system to, I want to talk about is Long Island Sound. I mentioned it's the U.S.'s third largest estuary, uh, and it's well known for experience hypoxia. In fact, there's records that go back to the middle of the 20th century showing hypoxia. This record goes to 1990, uh, 91, uh, and what it shows is that there are certain reasons that we know every summer will go hypoxic, uh, and in some cases that extends halfway across the system. So we began looking at this system. Um, in 2012, and so what I'm showing you here is a cruise during August of 2012, and the data is a, um, as you can see, an ocean data view plot, so it's a vertical profile uh, going from New York City, which is on the uh, left or the western extreme, going east to about the middle of Long Island, which is Fort Jefferson, and the plots are oxygen, pH, PCO2, and aragonite. Uh, excuse me, not aragonite, but the saturation state of aragonite. Uh, and what you can see is, uh, well, multiple trends. 
Firstly, uh, the water to the far west was hypoxic. Uh, concurrently, it was uh, very low in pH. And in fact, in the western extreme, this system was actually, the water in some cases was actually acidic. That is, the pH uh, in this particular profile here got below 7. Um, but you can see all of the bottom waters were very low in pH, uh, and these bottom waters also had very high levels of PCO2, uh, and nearly the entire system was undersaturated with regards to aragonite. Uh, so that is, the, um, the omega value was less than 1 um, for the entire water column to the west, and for uh, you know, more than half the water column in the middle of the, the transect, and about half of the water column when you get to the far east. So indeed, when this system has experienced hypoxia, it's also experiencing severe acidification and very high levels of CO2, I didn't say, but greater than 2,000 uh, microatmospheres of uh, PCO2. So this is just a snapshot of August. Uh, we then went into the Connecticut DEP records. Uh, they're monitoring Long Island Town to get a better sense of what the seasonal progression of acidification is like uh, in this system. So first, uh, I'm going to just show you bottom waters in western Long Island Sound. Uh, and that's what's shown here. So this is a time series, August 2010 through uh, the end of 2012. Uh, and you can see a fairly good correspondence between the levels of dissolved oxygen that are being measured uh, and the levels of pH, with the minimum for both occurring in the summer. Uh, and the maximums occurring somewhere uh, in the spring slash winter, uh, likely around the spring bloom. I notice that I note the correspondence uh, ends in this area, but I will emphasize that these last two points are right after uh, Hurricane Sandy, and so uh, well, hard to say exactly what was going on. Um, so that's one particular station. We dove into this data further to understand the entire system. And so that's what I'm going to show you now. The next series of plots are going to be um, section plots showing the depth of Long Island Sound, uh, and showing depth, and also the full extent of Long Island Sound. So the plots we saw before went to about halfway. This goes all the way to the eastern extent. So these are waters that are almost exchanging with the mouth of, uh, of Narragansett Bay. This is out in Block Island Sound. And so what we're going to go is from May through into the fall to give you a sense of how oxygen and pH changes with time, uh, and not in just one location, but throughout. Uh, and the contours here, I believe, are based on temperature. So you can see high oxygen and pH uh, in the spring, towards the end of the spring bloom. Um, but come June, as the, that uh, biomass declines, you can see things begin to change. Uh, pH levels begin to drop, oxygen levels begin to drop, and as we move into July, you can see uh, hypoxia setting up in the western part of Long Island Sound as stratification uh, gets strong, and concurrently we see the acidification. These pH levels uh, are not as low as we measured before, but I'll emphasize this is the NBS scale, so an offset uh, in our experience in the system, and our measurements are of a, about 0.15 units. Uh, but still acidification setting up along with that hypoxic water in July. Uh, that continuing in August and in fact spreading even further uh, to the east. And <clears throat> by September, uh, the acidification letting up a little bit by hypoxia um, remains in the system. Uh, and a little bit of the converse by October. So that is the oxygen levels getting nearly normal across the entire system while you still have the remnants of low pH to the far west. Um, and it, I'll actually emphasize now, uh, we believe that acidification estuaries hangs on longer in the fall than does hypoxia. Uh, that is to say, the colder water uh, is going to be uh, holding on to more, or able to dissolve more CO2 uh, and more oxygen. So the oxygen will go up while the pH may stay lower. Uh, and we also have uh, hypothesized that Anoxic sediments, uh, as they become re in the fall, are going to be releasing acids uh, from prior anaerobic activities uh, for metals and such that may also be driving down uh, the pH. So um, side note there that we do think 
uh, acidification is going to be more, uh, go on longer than hypoxia in estuaries. Um, so again, this low pH persisted from June through October. Uh, it's a seasonal occurrence. Um, acidification is that is summer into fall. And now to look at um, uh, omega values for Long Island Sound. This is from just last summer. Um, and again, this now goes from the city to Port Jefferson. So again, at the western half of Long Island Sound, where acidification is the most severe. Uh, and the data I'm going to show goes from July into the fall. Uh, and you can see by July, uh, the bottom waters, both to the west and a little bit to the east, uh, are already undersaturated with regards to aragonite. Uh, we move into early August, and you can see uh, nearly the entire water column um, throughout the system undersaturated, and certainly the definitely the entire water column to the far uh, west. Um, we continue to see that in late August. Uh, that is undersaturation within the uh, the eastern half of the system and the entire water column in the far west. Um, we had an interesting cruise in September where the boat broke down. So we got about half of the data. Uh, but the half that we got, the western half, and again, this, uh, this western half was pretty much understaturated for the entire uh, water column uh, with regards to aragonite. And by October, uh, things are clearing up. Uh, but at the same time, we're still seeing understaturation to the far west and uh, barely saturated in bottom waters as we move uh, to the east. And so that's Long Island Sound. I, I just want to jump in and show that what we're seeing there, we're also seeing in some other systems. Uh, and so I won't talk, show a lot of Narragansett Bay, but here is Narragansett Bay uh, in August of this past summer uh, when we saw to the, uh, just for perspective, this is the northern extent near, uh, near the Seekonk River in Narragansett Bay, uh, whereas uh, to the to the right here, this is where Narragansett Bay exchanged with Lock Island Town. Uh, and so what we saw during August of this past summer was uh, hypoxic waters to the northern extent in the bottom, and those hypoxic waters having low pH uh, and also being enriched in PCO2. So uh, this is a trend we've seen now uh, in at least four major estuary systems across the northeast US. Um, so just to give some summary points before we get into some of the biology, uh, uh, during hypoxia in, in these northeast U.S. estuaries, we're seeing level of CO2 uh, and pH that we don't expect in the open ocean until the 22nd century. Uh, so very uh, severe acidification. Uh, the acidification begins in June, goes on into September, sometimes even October. Um, and during late summer, we're seeing that large estuaries such as Long Island Sound are mainly undersaturated with regards to aragonite forms of calcium carbonate. Um, we think that sewage treatment plants are likely an important source of uh, both CO2 and acidification. Uh, and of course, going forward, as uh, uh, climate change proceeds, um, we think these systems will get continue to acidify, uh, even if oxygen levels may improve due to the abatement of nutrient levels. OK, so these systems are hypoxic and uh, acidified during summer. What are the implications for marine animals? Well, there's been a lot of research on hypoxia uh, during the past uh, 50 years or so, and a lot of review papers on um, the effects of hypoxia on marine life. Um, but one important point to recognize when it comes to this research is how much of the experimental work has been done. And I will say that the large majority of work that's published on this is experimental. And up until now, the very large majority, 90 some odd percent of experiments conducted, were done simply by bubbling nitrogen gas into seawater, which did a great job of evacuating oxygen out of the system and creating hypoxic conditions. Um, however, what the nitrogen bubbling also did was to blow out other gases as well. Uh, so you had the degassing of oxygen as well as CO2. So you were creating a condition of low oxygen and low CO2 and high pH. And what I've just spent a significant amount of time showing you is that that 
that is a condition that we do not find in estuarine ecosystems. Um, just to illustrate this further, we did an experiment uh, in our marine lab here in Southampton where we bubbled CO2 into seawater. Uh, and as we did that, we did a nice job, as I mentioned before, of driving down the oxygen, but also driving up the pH. So when we got to these hypoxic conditions, we were at a pH of about 8.5. Now, concurrently, I'll plot here uh, yet another system that experiences acidification hypoxia on Long Island, known as the Fort River. We collected discrete samples and measured the oxygen and pH of those samples through the summer of 2012. And here's the trend that we got going from uh, the spring into the summer, where there was severe hypoxia and acidification, as you can see, sometimes acidic samples. Um, and what you see is the great divide between what is set up when you just bubble with nitrogen and what actually occurs in an ecosystem. And you know, frankly, we had of more than one pH unit. Um, so almost all prior research on hypoxia was done under these pH conditions. Uh, what we need are experiments that look at what actually happens in an estuary. If you want to truly understand the dual stressor of the acidification of hypoxia, uh, we need a new approach because this obviously is not giving us the answers we're going to want. So we've devised an approach whereby instead of just bubbling nitrogen gas, we're also co-bubbling with CO2, also with air. Uh, we've had to play around with mixing um, CO2 into nitrogen gas as well. But in doing that, what we've been able to do is create the conditions uh, that are representative of estuarine ecosystems. So this just gives you a quick example of that. These are the levels of oxygen and pH uh, within an, ex an experiment. And what it shows are our four conditions we've looked at experimentally. A control, a hypoxic only condition, acidified only condition, and then both conditions together. Of course, our control, uh, and this is with uh, natural seawater, um, and so there is a little bit of variability, but our control having high levels of oxygen and pH. Um, our acidification treatment uh, in the green has high levels of oxygen, and when we add CO2, that drives down the pH. Um, our hypoxic only treatment uh, allows us to control and leave the pH where we want it to be while driving down the oxygen. And then finally, that treatment that has been so elusive for many years, and that is actually having water that is low in pH and low in oxygen. Uh, and again, if you go back and look at the papers, not many of them, um, I would say nearly, uh, I, I've only found one in the past that have uh, been able to, that have achieved these uh, conditions. So our first foray into using this experimental setup was looking at the effects on larval bivalves. Uh, I told you how that experiment was set up for maintaining water temperatures uh, via a water bath, for using brood stock from not heavily eutrophied estuaries to get these larvae. Uh, we're also working with some fish, so again, we're getting those brood stock from uh, meets trophic estuaries, also in some cases from hatcheries. Um, in all cases, we expose the either newly the newly fertilized larvae and embryos uh, to the conditions within the first 24 hours uh, of fertilization, and we found that to be so important because we are finding that both the bivalve larvae and the embryos are most sensitive during this period. Um, we are feeding all these organisms daily, changing water several times a week and documenting changes in size and development. So to get into the bivalve larvae, this is an experiment with scallop larvae showing four treatments and their survival over a nearly 40-day experiment. In this particular case, when we looked at the different treatments of hypoxia, acidification, or both, what we found is that the main effect uh, on survival of these scallop larvae is consistent with their prior research. That is, it's acidification. It's a significant treatment effect. Uh, not oxygen. Uh, so they're, they're hacking the oxygen, um, but they're, doing, they're not doing great under the low oxygen. So they're surviving, but they're having other important ramifications. So this is the metamorphosis of base scallops, so they go from larvae into juveniles. And you can see when they have enough oxygen, either in the control treatment or the acidified treatment, after about two weeks or so, they metamorphose into the juveniles. Whereas, if they are starved of oxygen, or at least under low oxygen conditions, you get a severe delay in metamorphosis. Um, 
And so statistically it bears out that oxygen is the main effect on metamorphosis here. And then further, if you look at the size of these individuals, uh, size scales with metamorphosis. So because they have a metamorphosis, um, if the individuals under low oxygen that are significantly smaller uh, than those when there's higher oxygen. So a small effect of pH compared uh, to hypoxia, which is really driving down their size. To affirm these results, we also used an approach where we went to the Forge River. I showed you some data from there, and here's the Forge River being shown. Highly populated with heavy nitrogen loads, both from duck farms as well as many septic tanks, occasional fish kills, uh, low pH and low oxygen through the summer. For this particular experiment, we collected water every few days, and we treated it in two ways. One, we added sodium carbonate, and in doing so, what we were able to do is take the pH that we normally found in the seawater and drive it up to a normal level. Uh, and then two, we also aerated the water, just bubbled it. So in doing that, we drove up both the oxygen and the pH. Um, and as you can see, when we just did the uh, addition of sodium carbonate, the oxygen levels stayed low. So we were able to resolve the effects of acidification versus both acidification and the hypoxia. So again, a parallel experiment with those bivalve larvae are shown here. And what this data set shows is that when we amend the raw water from the Forge River and buffer it with carbonate, doing that alone improves the survival of these individuals. So it's sort of affirming that it's acidification that affects the survival of these larvae. And importantly, what this shows is that bivalves spawning into the system um, if they have, they're going to have depressed survival, but that depressed survival is going to be due to the acidification. So this is evidence that today's acidification in estuaries is driving down the survival of bivalve populations. Again, consistent with our prior results, if we added the carbonate, we couldn't help these bivalves metamorphose quicker, and that they needed the high oxygen to metamorphose, uh, and we also found that it was the high oxygen needed to drive up their sizes. Because they never really metamorphosed in the other treatments without higher oxygen, their sizes, they, they were much, much smaller than the individuals that had metamorphosed. We've also looked at other species and other life stages when it comes to these conditions. So I just want to briefly show within a series of experiments with hard clams, uh, but I want to show this particular result because I think it's quite interesting. Um, this is with juvenile clams. Now, once they become juveniles, they're actually resistant to uh, the lethal effects of acidification. Um, but there are still growth effects. Um, so in this particular experiment, we exposed juvenile hard clams at this point four months old. So they were the hardiest of all the ages we looked at. At younger ages, they were more sensitive. Their growth rates were individually sensitive to either oxygen or pH. Uh, but at this age, you can see we expose them to just the low oxygen or just the low pH, their growth rates match the controls uh, and there is no effect. Uh, but we saw a very interesting statistical interaction between these two factors. So that is, while they could hack the individual stressors, when they're experienced both simultaneously, that depressed their, survive, their growth rates by more than 40%. Uh, and again, this is the condition that we're seeing uh, and estuaries, it's both the conditions at the same time. Uh, and what this also emphasizes is the importance of looking at both of these factors individually. If we just ran a hypoxia experiment or acidification experiment, uh, we would have missed what's actually happening with an ecosystem, within an ecosystem setting. Uh, the last part of my talk now will focus on forage fish. Uh, and so forage fish is a sort of a recently coined term uh, they're generally planktivorous fish, uh, but recently uh, some studies have emphasized the importance of forage fish, uh, in essence their dual importance in ecosystems as one, predators of plank planktonic groups, but also a very important energetic link as prey uh, to a lot of upper uh, trophic level species. Uh, and so they play a crucial role and a lot of coastal uh, and even open ocean ecosystems. And what we found, as I think I alluded to earlier, 
these some species of forage fish are sensitive to acidification. So we began work with uh, the Atlantic Silverside, Menilia barolina, and specifically working with the embryo stage, again exposing the embryos right away. This is looking at just the acidification. Uh, and these were a series of experiments. Uh, the different colors are from different experiments. I believe it's six different experiments. Um, and what the data shows is that as you drive up the CO2 levels, uh, you drive down their survival. Uh, and there's some spread to the data because these are different broods of, uh, of embryos. But even across all experiments, you can see what the trend is. These fish are sensitive to acidification um, in the embryonic stage. And you can see the levels we use are within the range that we're seeing in coastal ecosystems. Uh, and I don't think I emphasized it before, but I'll emphasize now. These fish spawn uh, beginning in May, and that spawning can go on into July. So this is within the time when we're seeing acidification in estuaries. So knowing that these fish are sensitive to acidification, we then wanted to understand how the estuarine conditions of acidification and hypoxia uh, affected these individuals. And so for the first experiment I'm going to show you, we're again focused on Menidia barolina. And you can see we had uh, essentially a two by two experimental design, similar to the last one, uh, comparing a pH of normal pH, so this is on a total scale of uh, around 7.94 to uh, 7.4, and then high oxygen to uh, hypoxic conditions. And so how did that affect the, uh, these individuals? Well, first, it affected their ability to hatch, or how long it took them to hatch. And that is to say, uh, oxygen significantly delayed the uh, hatching of these organisms. It took them longer, uh, it's about two days longer to hatch. Um, further, there were significantly fewer individuals hatching under low oxygen conditions. When it came to survival, uh, we saw an effect of acidification once again, and also an effect of oxygen. Uh, and you can see the outcomes under both stressors were very, very poor, uh, but the results were additive. That is to say, they'd be statistically predicted based on these individual um, uh, performances under each of these conditions. Uh, but it does emphasize that under the ecosystem, the true ecosystem conditions, uh, you really need to look at both uh, of these stressors. We also looked at uh, a second Menidia species, Menidia menidia, known as the Atlantic silver side. Uh, and you can see the conditions used here. Uh, the pH level, the low pH is a little bit higher as with the low oxygen. Um, but the results were somewhat similar uh, in that there was a delay in hatching due to the lower oxygen as well as fewer individuals hatching uh, under the low oxygen conditions. And in this case, an interesting result, a minor depression in survival from acidification, a larger depression uh, due to oxygen in both cases, significant decrease, uh, but then a synergistic effect of oxygen acidification. So that is, when you expose these individuals to low pH and low CO, the survival was significantly lower than would have been predicted by either individual stressor. Uh, and that was surprising. And for these individuals, we also had length. And in this case, the size was uh, a function of uh, oxygen. It was significantly depressed by oxygen. Uh, and I should emphasize this is work by my graduate student, Elizabeth D. Pasquale. We're, we're working on this, uh, writing this up for publication right now. Uh, and so with that, I will conclude. Uh, some major conclusion points is that Northeast U.S. estuaries experience low oxygen and acidification during the same season that early life stage fish and shellfish are spawned into the estuary and are developing. Uh, the impacts of both hypoxia and acidification uh, on most marine life are currently not well understood because of that issue I brought up earlier, the fact that Prior experiments did not properly control pH, and in fact used a pH that was off likely by more than a full unit. Um, but the, when we 
performed experiments using the levels of hypoxia and acidification that we see in estuaries, uh, we see that these conditions can both additively or synergistically depress the growth and survival uh, of multiple species of both forage fish and bivalves. Um, and so these multiple stressors may be combining to negatively impact coastal fisheries. Uh, as I said, the one experiment where using the actual water in the estuary and using bivalves to survive in there, they're doing poorly. If we fix the pH, they do better. Um, so with that, I'll acknowledge support um, from, uh, from NOAA uh, in their Ocean Acidification Program, National Science Foundation's uh, Biological Oceanography Program, and also the new Tamarin Foundation. And of course, very importantly, uh, my lab group, but again, Elizabeth E. Pasquale, shown here, did a lot of the fish experiments. Uh, Andy Griffith involved in many of the bivalve experiments, and Ryan Wallace uh, has led the field effort in documenting acidification in our uh, northeast U.S. estuaries. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions if there are any.